though the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival used to provoke her severely, to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year after year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkanah, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. Hannah was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow, O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your, the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give your servant a male child, then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants, nor razor shall touch his head. As she continually prayed before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, therefore, Eli thought that she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation for all this time. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house in Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she named him Samuel. For she said, I have asked him of the Lord. Our gospel reading today comes from the gospel of Mark in the 12th chapter. Listen to God's word. Now, as Jesus taught, he said, Beware of scribes who like to walk around in long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplace and to have the best seats in the synagogue, in places of honor at the banquets. They devour widows' houses, and for the sake of appearances, they say long prayers. They will receive greater condemnation. Now, Jesus sat down opposite the treasury, and he watched the crowd putting in money into the treasury. Many people, rich people, put in large sums, then a poor widow came, and she put in two small copper coins, which are worth about a penny. Then Jesus called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she put in out of her poverty everything she had and all that she had to live on. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks. Let us pray. Gracious God, do grant that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So it was about a month ago, I put that sign up back there, the initials. T-I-Y-C, S-D-A-W. And I made it a contest. I thought it would be fun. No explanation was given, and a lot of people asked me. A lot of people wanted hints. 
but I included a gift certificate to one of my favorite places to eat. And um, it didn't take long for people to figure out what the first four letters were. And everybody that guessed was right on the first four letters. It stands for this is your church. Now the last four letters stumped a lot of people. And I had some very creative guesses. <laughs> What's leaving me questioning, though? This is your church. Sit down and weep. I don't get that. <laughs> but there were three people who guessed correctly. And so since I have one gift certificate, I have three winners. I put their three correct guesses in a basket, and I'm going to have... Where'd Alex go? <laughs> I guess I'm going to have Liam pick it. Um, I'm going to have him pick the winner. So, Leah, there's three winners in here. Will you come up and pick the right one out? The right one. The right one. <laughs> the right one that's going to win. Okay. So you read it so there's no question. Who's, who, what's it say? <laughs> okay, I'll read it. So the answer is, this is your church seven days a week. And the winner is Jane Bowden. Yay. The other two correct guesses were both named Jenny. So great minds think alike. So I decided to do that as I was trying to think about stewardship. Because nobody likes to preach about stewardship. No pastor likes to preach about stewardship. It's a topic that we all try to avoid. And I try to come up with a fun way to bring it into perspective for all of us. Um, most, Some of you here, anybody here not remember who Jack Benny was? I'm guessing Liam and Dakota. <laughs> but most people remember Jack Benny. And he was a comedian. And he had a reputation for being a tightwad. And... On one day, on, he was uh, doing a skit on the radio, and he said on his way, he had been accosted at, at gunpoint uh, to be robbed. And the robber said, your money or your life? And after a long pause and a couple more jabs with the gun, Benny said, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. <laughs> well, I heard of one pastor who used that theme for his stewardship sermon. And uh, his t the title of his sermon was, Your Money or Your Life. And immediately after the sermon, the choir got up and sang that familiar hymn, Take My Life. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody, no pastor likes to preach about stewardship. But we can't run a church without having enough money to run it. You can't run your homes without having enough money to run them. You can't pay the heat, you can't pay the lights, you can't put food on the table, you can't pay your insurance. And I think the reason that most pastors don't like to preach about stewardship is that because in most churches in this country, the largest portion of the budget is the pastor's salary. So you feel like you're getting up there and preaching for your own salary, which shouldn't be. Another way to look at it is how do you measure the things in your life? This is coming up to be Thanksgiving this week. What are the blessings in your life? How do you measure what's important in your life? You know, in our world today, we want everything bigger and better, or we want an extra perk. So we go to a fast food restaurant, and we order our meal, and then for only 20 more cents, you can supersize your drink or supersize your sandwich. We all want those things. Now, I was thinking of when you go into a grocery store, how many aisles of candy there are. Now, there are all sorts of candy, and when I opened my convenience store, one of the most fun things I did was I opened a bulk candy with the old-fashioned candies, Mary Jane's, and, and all those old, you know, the buttons, and, and, uh, and rings, and the necklaces, and all the things that we used to get when we were kids. Well, in some grocery stores, you know, you walk in and first you've got a display almost when you first walk in of some sort of sweets that hit you of all different shapes and sizes. And then some stores have that bulk 
handy that you can go to. But then as you come up to the register, oh my gosh, you're bombarded with every kind of shape and size and package of bubble gum that you could imagine. And all the sweet gooey candies that, that bubble up in your mouth or pop in your mouth or do all sorts of things. We all have different standards of weighing and measuring and determining what is bad and what is good. Standards of taste and tastefulness are as varied as people. Some people are purists. They only want a Hershey bar. Some people like a Hershey bar but have almonds in it. Now a purist would tell you that's not true chocolate. So people have different standards. Some are m and people. I went to a conference this past week and the presenter had done this conference before and she said that the one reason she likes to come there, and this, this is, was at the New York State Tribute Foundation, which is the New York State Funeral Directors Foundation, and she said, because they have the best snacks I've ever had at any conference. <laughs> but she said, after the last time, I asked them, please do not bring any peanut M&Ms because I ate three bags. <laughs> so there were no peanut M&Ms, which was too bad. I, I, in one way, I was glad because I'm not eating chocolate anymore, but um, that would have been my favorite and probably my downfall had they been there. So we all have different tastes and we all think about what is important to us. As we come up on Thanksgiving, what is important to you? You know, all we need is one thing to happen in our lives and it levels out everything else. If we have a bad piece of news, suddenly all our priorities get shifted and we realize what really is important. What is important in your life? The blessings you have, the family you have, the people you love. In a church, it's the ministries that you're doing. What happened to the simple gifts of life? The challenges that greet Jesus as he walked into that temple that day were great. They were similar to what we face today. There were people who were rich and important and trying to make a big spectacle of what they were giving. And yet Jesus said that this woman gave more than all of them because she put two coins into the collection, all that she had to give to the Lord. She measured what was important to her by what her life was about. She knew that God had given her the blessings she needed, and that's what she gave out of. Now, I was reading some commentaries this week about this passage, and it was really interesting how they've changed from the last time I preached this text. Um, a lot of the commentators were saying that Jesus now determined that he was not lauding the purse-emptying donation of the poor widow, but rather he was appalled by what he witnessed in the, temp in the temple. He said that the widow was more of a pawn in the hands of the greedy, grasping religious establishment. The widow's wrong-headed gift was word-whipped out of her by the religious establishment. Now, I wonder if that commentator wasn't speaking more out of this century's values than what was really going on back then. Issues of salvation and practices and self-sacrifice are no longer popular or public concourses. People are more concerned with what they can get. How much more can I get? It's really a difficult time to be living. You know, we look at simplifying everything, but our scales have changed in our country. And if we could strip back those scales and go back to what's really important, if when something happens in our lives and our priorities shift and we realize where we should be, if we could come back to that, how our lives would be so different. I was reading a comment about Mother Teresa. Born Agnes Boyashkin to Albanian parents, she went to India in 1929 as a member of the Loretto Order of Nuns. There she taught for many years and became headmistress of a school. In 1946, she received her call within a call to work with the poorest of the poor. By 1948, she received permission to leave the Loretto Order 
and trained in the nursing skills she needed to carry out her calling. She prayed, O oh God, if I cannot help these people in their poverty and their suffering, let me at least die with them, close to them, so that I can show them your love. Was it wasted time and energy? Wasted might? Are the scales falling from her eyes? Are the standards of measurement changing? From the simple beginning, the missionaries of charity, which is what Sister, uh, Mother Teresa's order became, have grown to include 4,000 sisters and brothers, 755 homes, 1,369 medical clinics that serve 120,000 people worldwide. Mother Teresa's might had money, and it was a might of love. But you're no Mother Teresa, you say. Well, how about uh, William McGee and his wife Kathleen? They were founders of Operation Smile. One was a plastic surgeon and the other a social worker. And it began in 1982, and since then it has performed surgery on 18,000 children in 15 countries without any charge at all. McGee said, the world is changed by emotion. I just re returned from a presbytery meeting Tuesday, Tuesday night. We were looking at our budget for next year. It's pretty sad. It's pretty sad. We've had more churches close. There are more churches about to close. People are closing often, not even just for lack of money, but also for lack of people. We are a blessed church. We are a truly blessed church. Our custodian, Marty, says almost every week, this church is busy. It gets used almost every day. He said he can't keep up with it. Isn't that what you want in a church? Isn't that why you come here? You want a church that does things, and that's the reputation we have in the community. Oh, that's the church that does stuff. We're having a new members class after service today, and we'll be taking members in next month. And one, of, as I was preparing for the class, I asked Tammy if she would give me the whole list of the ministries that we put on that board. There are 31 ministries on that board. That's a lot of stuff that we're doing. So you have to ask yourself, what are you giving your time and your talents and your money for? Are you happy? Do you want a church that does ministry? Are there ministries that you want that we're not doing here? Should we be doing even more ministry? Because that's what a church is about. So at our presbytery, the, uh, Tim Coombs, who's no longer going to have his job because he, his job was cut, stood up, and he was the minister of congregational vitality. So his job was to help churches that were struggling. And he stood up and he said the latest research he has read is that the churches that will survive today are the churches that are doing ministry, mission and ministry. They are not just churches that come on Sunday and leave immediately after. They are churches where the church is being used seven days a week. They are churches who have opportunities for people to use their talents and their time, people to get involved, people to give what they can as a disciple of Christ. And he said that the most important sign of a church that's going to live is the feeling of life that you have when you walk in the door. So if you haven't already thought about this, I ask you to think about when you walk in this door, do you feel life and vitality and vibrancy? That is what a church needs today. I believe that the Holy Spirit is alive and well in this church. You can feel it when you come in here and worship. We have people, we have the Holy Spirit, and we have a lot of ministry that we're trying to do. So, I invite you today to give of your time, your talents, and your treasures to support a ministry that you believe in. Amen.